Welcome to my talk about asymmetric heterogeneous multiprocessing, HMP, HMP, mainline, Linux, and Zephyr in Unison. Just a quick introduction to myself. I joined Toradex in 2011. I spearheaded there the embedded Linux adoption, and I introduced the upstream first policy and at times I was a top 10 U-boot as well as Linux kernel ARM SOC contributor. And we have an indus industrial embedded Linux platform called Torizon. And this is all fully based on mainline technology. So we are using uh, mainline U-boot with DistroBoot, KMS, DRM graphics with Etnavif and Nuvo, over the air update with OS3 and we're using Docker respectively Podman as the container uh, platform for <coughs> applications. What am I talking about today? Uh, I will start with a quick evolution of the uh, microcontroller, then I look at the integration of those into the Linux ec ecosystem, and I give a quick overview of some open source real-time OSs that are available out there. Then we're gonna dive into the HMP, HMP uh, topic with looking at the life cycle. So how can you actually launch code on such platforms? And then, we're gonna look at mainline Linux and Zephyr, how they can work in Unison. We look at the remote processor framework, remote proc, then the remote processor messaging, RP message. We also have a look at the communication libraries involved there, like uh, OpenHMP. And at the end, I will give a quick real life demo here. I brought some hardware as well, and we can see how one can actually run code. So the microcontroller, it basically started with the Texas Instruments TMS-1000. It was a four-bit one. That was in 1971, commercially available 1974. This combined read-only memory and read-write memory and all in a processor, including the clocks. Then, of course, Intel with the AT48, which was a 8-bit microcontroller. If it first shipped in 1977. It used EEPROM for development, and uh, for that you had usually quite expensive those ceramic packages that uh, had this uh, quartz window that you could, with ultraviolet light, you could basically erase it. And then in production, usually you had a one-time programmable one. Then of course the Intel 8086, the IAPX86 was the first 16-bit microprocessor that uh, shipped first time in 1978. However, that required several additional ICs around it to, to really realize a full system. Then another family is from Motorola, the HC05s. They had a serial bootloader and EEPROM program storage that entered in late 1980s. Then another one is the microchip, the PIX. They also use EEPROM. They entered in like 1993, and they first time uh, allowed rapid prototyping with uh, in-system programming, so that you could really use some kind of a probe to program it in, in the system. And also in 1993, Atmel introduced the first uh, microcontroller that used actual flash memory technology. And those 16-bit microcontrollers, there are the dominant vo volume since 2011. 
So that shows, I mean, 8-bit microcontrollers, they're still around and also still, before 2011, were, were still dominant in the market. Let's have a look how such microcontrollers, they integrate into the Linux ecosystem. Of course, you can have independent such microcontrollers that are interacting with a Linux system. For interfacing, uh, often, for example, I2C may be used, or it may be mapped uh, to a memory mapped IO bus, or uh, SPI, Serial Peripheral Interface. All of those are, of course, uh, supported by in-kernel subsystems. Another subsystem or, or functionality that might help in integrating such is the generic register map support. So the, the reg map, basically you see here where it's documented and where it, uh, you can find the source code in the Linux kernel. And that allows you to basically uh, more generically access registers of such microcontrollers when, when you, you know, want to uh, interact with them from a Linux system. Another functionality that got integrated on the Linux side is the firmware loading. There is an in-kernel firmware IPI. This got first introduced actually to update microcode for CPU erratas. So you might uh, you know, remember the early Intel Pentium days where they had some issues there and basically required in-field updating such microcode and that's when, when this kind of uh, functionality was born and introduced into Linux. So nowadays it can also be used to update the uh, device driver firmware. So it might be required to be loaded on such uh, devices uh, microcontrollers. So you might have a network controller or a storage controller that has additional microcontrollers where you can update the firmware like that. Another thing that it might be used is to actually uh, update device driver information data. For example, calibration data. So maybe in a factory, it might be that device might get calibrated and that calibration data can then be updated also with this infrastructure. Of course, it might also be stored in some EEPROM or, or things like that. How does it work? It, you can have a firmware request. It can be either synchronous. So basically, if the requested firmware is available, then it is, is copied to that uh, device's firmware, and then that entry can be released. Or it uh, also allows uh, asynchronous such uh, requests. Another thing that exists is a special optimization for reboots. So if you, for example, have a, a server or something with a storage card with such firmware, if it just does a reboot, it, it can use it, basically it can cache it, the firmware, so it doesn't have to basically reload the whole thing. There is also firmware upload API. Uh, it has a persistent SysFS node, so it allows at runtime that the user can just initiate the firmware update via SysFS. And another place where this can be used is for example on uh, FPGA, for FPGA programming, for example on the Intel Stratix 10 SOC. And the documentation for this is uh, available there. Another uh, subsystem is the multifunction miscellaneous devices or multifunction device drivers, the MFD. This basically allows when you have uh, some kind of heterogeneous hardware blocks that uh, might contain more than just one uh, kind of non-unique 
varying hardware functionality. So you can basically share uh, stuff. So it can, for example, use an ex external bus to interface to this microcontroller that then can be used by different uh, functionality. And one uh, way this is also used is usually for memory registers that contain some miscellaneous uh, system registers. That is also often known as so-called co uh, system controllers or syscons. That's uh, on many SOCs you find that used there, yeah. And the documentation for MFD I noted here as well. And then of course, there are also HMP or HMP integrated remote proc RP message, which we're now gonna have a closer look at. But first, let's have a quick look at the available real-time operating systems. I'm actually not gonna go in detail here. You'll find this on, on my slides. But there is like ECOS, FreeRTOS is quite popular. There is the new one from ARM, the Embed OS, and MicroC OS 3, NotX, Riot is an interesting one. Then RT Thread is a more dominant uh, in, in Asia, or I think mostly in China, I'm not sure in Japan. Then Artems, and of course Zephyr, which uh, I guess uh, Kate already introduced uh, more, most of this. Uh, very interesting to uh, repeat what she said, so it's really nowadays the uh, most active open source real-time OS project. Now let's have a look how does the life cycle look like. So one possibility is that, that you would basically boot uh, such a course directly from the boot room in some kind of a boot container. Uh, I had a look at the, some of the, you know, hardware platforms that we use in our company, and it turns out this is not supported on the iDynamics 7 solo or the dual. So this is uh, I copied it from the, you know, the reference manuals. It's also not supported on the iDynamics 8 and Mini or the 8 and Plus. So they do actually not support that you immediately from the boot room would, would just boot this uh, M4 or M7 core. They basically only boot the A core first. Of course, you can immediately in the A core have some kind of a little bootloader that then loads the other one. We will get to that uh, later. However, this is supported on some kind of special uh, Platforms that also are often used for like safety critical systems where you really, it allows you to directly from the boot room load stuff. For example, on the iDotemix 8 uh, Quad Max, there the system control unit is basically already running on an M4. And uh, yeah, the boot room basically st really starts executing on this one. However, uh, yeah, this, the application processor and the Cortex M4s, they have no direct access to those uh, hardware mechanisms that are used there in this system control unit and it's basically envisioned by the vendor that you, you know, you load this uh, proprietary SU firmware on there. Mm -hmm. But who knows, maybe there once will be some 
community project that would rewrite such firmware and, and have it an open source option available. But right now, this is rather uh, very proprietary. And I have not looked at other SOC vendors. They might have uh, better options available in, in, in this area. And like I mentioned before, of course, it's one possibility is that even so, if you uh, start booting on the A core, you can then, even from a bootloader, like for example, U boot, you can then load firmware for a M4 or M7 core. In U boot, this is done using the so called boot aux command. So it's, it supports booting auxil auxiliary cores. There is this config IMX boot aux. Uh, in our case, so when you have a NXPI.MX uh, SOC, it's available for I.MX6, where there, there is the SX, which has an additional uh, heterogeneous core, or the I.MX7, or the 8M, including the Mini and the Plus, and also the, the Fibrid, which is kind of a special uh, you know, came from the automotive side, but it's more or less a similar kind of architecture. Of course, the implementation of this boot aux is uh, SOC specific, so how exactly these cores are basically started and, and things like that. And this code you might find uh, at that path I've given here. But the implementation of the actual command boot aux, uh, that's you basically give it the address where uh, you have loaded the code that you then want to execute on that core. And it may do optional memory reservation. It's usually done uh, via device tree, so the bootloader will pass this also to the Linux side and there is a config available for that as well, where you can basically configure the, the base address of it and the size. And it supports M4, respectively M7. Remember the Idodemix 8M Plus has actually an, an, an M7, while as the other ones have an M4 or M4s. And you can Either load the firmware as raw binaries. The, the command to do that is I've given here. So you, there, not only you have to you know, load it to a certain address, you also have to make sure then to uh, flush the cache and then go on to actually booting it with the boot aux command. Much easier it is to use uh, ELF files because remember ELF files, they have that information about the addressing in their headers and then it's much easier. You can basically uh, just load it to some load adder. It doesn't matter uh, because the boot aux command will then parse the header and figure out where exactly it has to actually put it and will execute it from there. Then a third way to do it, which is more interesting in, in terms of my talk, of course, is that you do actually do that from the Linux side. So modern SOCs with such heterogeneous remote processors, they, they are often available in such asymmetric configurations. And there, uh, basically, it allows different platforms, architectures to control to power on, load firmware, power off those remote processes. Uh, and it also, of course, allows abstracting such hardware differences. So from a Linux kind of a user point of view, this is all, uh, you know, transparent to the user. Then it further, of course, uh, also adds RP message via the IO de devices so you can actually then 
also communicate after you loaded your code and started it on, on those, you can then also communicate with, with those additional cores. The user API is basically, it has a call rproc boot, so that allows you to boot it. Booting meaning it loads the firmware and powers the core on. Usually, you know, it's about clocks and power domain, stuff like that. Then it can also be powered off. There is the rproc shutdown call. So a previously booted one basically can be uh, turned off again. Usually it does not decrement the rproc ref counting. So it only, only the power ref counting. That means the user can still use uh, such a uh, handle in, in a subsequent RPROC boot call again. So you could basically boot a certain firmware, shut it down again, boot another firmware, shut it down. You could even have use cases like that. And then there is another call to actually find such RPROC handle using a device 3 p handle. Then how does the implementer's API look? So if you basically uh, you know, are an SOC vendor and would want to, to implement that. So it has the rproc alloc that allocates a new such a processor, remote processor handle. Then there is a similar free. There is also a register, so it's available within the remote proc framework. And then there is a call so you can unroll th this adding and then there is also a way to uh, do a crash report. So if something would go wrong, so if, if you have in your SOC some mechanism to detect some problem, you could also report that. There is also a call for that. And then, of course, there are uh, the callbacks for start, stop, and there is an additional one for kick. This is mainly used when you have some communication between the cores, so you could update the other side that, that, that you want it to notify it now. So it can interrupt the remote processor to let it know that, that in a weird queue there is something available. And then of course there is also a binary firmware structure, usually it, uh, uh, yeah, on the Linux Artbrock side, it uses uh, exclusively ELF, either in the 32 or 64 bit flavor, depending on what kind of a core you have. Then the kernel configuration in Linux for that is called Config Remote Proc, or the more specifically for the IDOTMX case, Config IMX Remote Proc. And you also need to add in the device tree certain things. It's, it's uh, for example, in the IMX7 case, you have this IMX7D CM4. And there you, you give it the clock, for example. This is the root clock of your M4 core. There is also a special property called FSL auto boot. That would basically uh, immediately when you boot Linux also via remote proc boot your uh, M4 core. Then you can give it some memory regions, for example, for, for your code and for the SRAM. And another thing, which I kind of scratched before, this syscon stuff, which basically means that some of the uh, registers that are relevant to, to control such cores are available uh, in the SOC in some memory area, which, which is used for, uh, you know, for miscellaneous stuff and that you have to give it this syscon handle. And then the reserve memory, on the right side there you see how you can do that. For example, on IMX7, uh, these are some specific addresses which are basically reserved, meaning that those are mapped that the A and the M cores can access these memory areas. And then this is hands-on how one can use the SysFS interface to do that. We will actually revisit that in the live demo if I happen to have enough time at the end. 
uh, so we will actually be able to live on the system execute those. But it basically allows you to uh, yeah, check the state of, of the remote proc when, for example, you started it from U-boot and it would have a state of attached. And then you can, of course, stop it. Uh, you can give it new firmware, which it's as convenient as just writing or copying, basically, an L file to, to some SysFS node. And then you can actually start that firmware again uh, with echo start. And then if you started it like that, it will show as a state running. Now let's have a look at when you now started such firmware, how can Linux and the Zephyr side talk to each other? And the mechanism for that is RP message. So remote proc, we just covered that. That's for the life cycle, how you execute your code. And RP message is for the communication. It's basically a weird IO based messaging bus. It allows the kernel drivers to communicate with, with such uh, remote processors. Uh, of course, one thing to note is that it might have some security implications. For example, the, you know, your remote processor may have full or at least partial access to certain memory or peripherals in your system. That's one thing that, uh, you know, from a system design perspective, of course, you have to keep in mind. Then the RP message device, basically you can communicate, you have communication channels, they are identified by name and some local source and the remote destination address. And you can listen on channels, meaning there is a receive, an RX callback, which is bound to such a unique RP message local address. And then the RP message core will basically dispatch incoming messages according to a destination address. And as mentioned above, this is implemented using so-called WIRT IO, which is a mailbox, it has a mailbox style synchronization, usually with a transmit, receive, and the so-called RXDB, that is the doorbell, basically how you can notify the other side. And Usually, the, uh, it uses shared so-called wearing buffers. In Linux, there is a, the device tree binding is documented as i given it here. Basically, the first one is for the uh, mailbox unit. Then, of course, it's a regular memory managed I.O. for is used for the weird I.O. And there is also the weird I.O. device. And the documentation for the RP message you find in the, st in the staging part of the documentation. And the configs for it is the config IMX mbox with the source code you can find there. And there is config weird I.O. and config weird I.O. MMIO. One thing to note is, of course, depending again on your SOC, uh, you ha have to make sure that whatever peripheral you might use from whatever core side that has to be disabled or not used from the other cores in your system, otherwise uh, bad things might happen. So, uh, yeah, like GPIOs or, or UARTs or things like that. Then in the device tree, this looks as follows. Basically, that, uh, you know, IMX7 DCM4 node that I introduced before, it can also have additional uh, nodes and properties uh, for RP message. For example, you give it the inbox names, TXRX, RXDB, and you actually allocate which inboxes are used for that, which are then handles to the, to the MU stuff. And of course, in the memory regions, you additionally have to uh, add these RP message viewing buffers. 
and this is how you, the, the memory for those can be allocated. And also the, those MUs that are referenced earlier, of course, you also have to enable, so put the status of those to enabled. Then, of course, there is also the Zephyr side, and that's actually where uh, open HMP comes into play, and that I'm going to discuss now. So open asymmetric multiprocessing, open HMP, that's basically a framework providing software components to enable such uh, development of HMP applications. It's actually a Linaro community project, and it allows operating systems to interact with a broad range of such complex heterogeneous architectures. It allows asymmetric multiprocessing application to basically leverage the parallelism offered by such multi-core configurations. And it has integrated lifecycle management and also, of course, the interprocessor communication IPC, which uh, basically is what RP message is not. And it provides a standalone library usable with RTOSs or you may also use that, of course, bare metal. You could, you know, run your bare metal code on, on the M4 code and also use this uh, uh, open HMP library. It's compatible with upstream Linux remote proc and RP message components. It uh, supports the following HMP configurations, either uh, a Linux host with a generic or bare metal remote or a generic bare metal host with a Linux remote. And th the way that is kind of done is it has some proxy infrastructure and it also has some uh, demo showcases that with the ability to, to handle also printf, scanf, open, close, read, write calls from bare metal based remote contexts. So you could integrate that easily. This is the source structure of the OpenHMP framework. And in uh, the Zephyr world, you find that on the Zephyr projects, modules, lib, OpenHMP. So that's basically integrated in, in the Zephyr sources. There are also a, a few other communication libraries available, for example, RP Message Lite or ERPC. I just quickly wanted to mention that there are also other possibilities Th that usually are rather used in even more resource constraint, for example, Cortex-M0 or, or very small code size, smaller than 5K kind of implementations. Very good. Then we can have a look at uh, the actual hardware here. I have uh, prepared a real life demo I actually, we have different hardware available uh, for today. I actually only brought the one on the left side. This is basically an iDynamic 7 system. The, the actual system on module is on the back side of this uh, board. And the nice thing about this board is that it's basically, you just can Connect it by USB, it will power it, it will immediately has an FTDI which gives you the console. And actually, I have another FTDI here that you also see uh, connected to some header there that will actually give you the, the Zephyr console. Let's have a look how that actually looks. Actually, let me quickly first go back here. Remember when I said um, we can do this hands-on stuff, so we can actually one-to-one -one, uh, do this use case here. I go back here and I have the console. I actually have on the left side, this is th from the A-Core. It's now booted into U-Boot. And on the right side, oops, let's see whether I maybe... No, it should be fine. Well, it's probably just outputted some garbage from the M, M core. Let's hope nothing to be worried about. 
So from the U-boot side, for example, I can now list here, this is an MMC-based thing, so it, it has some files available here. For this demo, I, for example, can use this sever blinky elf file. Let's have a look here. Ah, this is from the Linux side. We actually start further. We can start with that one here. So from uboot with the boot aux command. Uh, as I'm a little bit lazy, I'm going to use the L file one, uh, which usually anyway makes much more sense. Oops, I guess I might have to go here to actually select it. So I can do that one here. However, I want to use the blinky one. So this actually just defines uh, the, that there is now a boot, so I can run. Uh, thank you very much. Here you go. Then we can run that. And it should all go according to plan. It should start blinking. It indeed does. That has the LED here. So, and we can also look at the whether it outputted something here. And it did, indeed did. So, this is the Zephyr basically on the other UART. Uh, and then we're still in boot, uh, in, the, in the bootloader now. We can also run the A core side of things. For example, distro. Uh, let's see. Then it starts the Linux kernel side, and, and uh, I mean, it still continues blinking, so the M4 core is still, of course, executing. And like I said, on the Linux device driver side, I made sure I'm not touching now any of his peripherals, so it, uh, that core will just continue to run, basically. But I set it all up that uh, RP message, uh, re uh, yeah, remote proc and RP message is all basically known now, and we can now switch to this other slide that I had here, so we can basically check what the state is of it. And like I said, when it started from U-boot, it has a state of attached. And then we can, for example, stop it. If one stops it, it, it now doesn't blink anymore. I actually stopped it when it's on, so it just stays on. And we can check the state again. Then it shows us offline. That's how it is done. Now we can actually copy some firmware. I have to make sure somehow it doesn't automatically mount my stuff anymore. Don't know how that happened, but I just mount it again. So this is basically the same EMMC stuff we saw before, and I can now just copy that, uh, let's see, from Mount Zephyr Blinky. I copy that to this uh, SysF uh, lib firmware file. This is the default file that is used. And then we can start it up again, which is say start. And it should actually start blinking again. And if it started like that, we can check its state, and it uh, has a state of uh, running. That's uh, the difference, basically. OK. That is basically it for my talk. And you might have some questions. I can also, uh, yeah. Any questions? Yeah. <laughs>
Okay, thank you very much.